Today we're closing this teaching series titled Live Missionally. And everyone should have received a mini Jesus and we'll get to him in a moment. <clears throat> but um, we're closing this teaching series titled Live Missionally. This is part seven. And I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. Would you turn to Matthew chapter 12? Matthew chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 33. Last week, last week the main idea was a divided house will not stand. And Jesus makes this very clear statement in verse 30. Anyone who is not with me is against me, and anyone who does not gather with me scatters. And so Jesus makes this very clear, very bold statement to those listening that day. And if you recall, we talked about which kingdom are you on. We asked the question, which kingdom are you a part of? Which team are you a part of? And today, as we close this chapter 12, if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write this down. Uh, stop faking it and do the will of God. Uh, we're not going to mix words. Jesus didn't mix words. We're just going to get right to the heart of it. If we're going to live missionally, we're going to be the church that Jesus has called us to be. We're going to be the follower of Jesus, that he has saved you and set you free. And there's a purpose, great purpose in your life. If you're breathing, there's opportunities to make him known, to live for his glory. The challenge for us today is simply stop faking it and do the will of God. Amen. Stop faking it and do the will of God. Look to verse 33 with me. Either make the tree good and its fruit will be good or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. For a tree is known by its fruit. We see as Jesus continues this coming off the heels off of, are you with me or are you against me? Are you with me or are you against me? He makes this very clear statement that the tree is known by its fruit. When we're driving down the road and, 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 and you see uh, orange trees and there's oranges hanging off the orange tree. You can easily identify that tree as an orange tree. That tree is an orange tree. Why? Because there's evidence that it's an orange tree because there's oranges hanging off of it. I'm not the, I'm not the brightest crown in the box, you know, but uh, I mean, I know that that is an orange tree because there's an orange hanging off of that tree. We planted a mango tree a few years ago. <clears throat> And we're still trying to determine, I'm still trying to determine, my wife's got it figured out. I'm still trying to figure out if this thing is really a mango tree. Why? Because it's never once produced mangoes. It's never once produced mangoes. And I, I was told if you take a stick and you go beat, beat it, then it will like shock it. And, and so that's about to go, that's about to happen. That's about to happen. Because uh, we're all contributors on, on this, on the, on, 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 in this home, right? And so even the trees. And so I'm looking at it yesterday. I'm looking at this mango tree. I'm like, are you really a mango tree? Like, I know the leaf might kind of look like a mango tree leaf, but man, there's been no, there's been no fruit. There's been no mangoes come from this tree. And, and, and in this time, as you travel the Holy Land, it would make sense that Jesus would use these illustrations to really help the truth come alive. Uh, olive trees are, are, are throughout and you know they're olive trees. Well, one, because they're like short and kind of cute and like, you know, to the point, but, but, but because they bear olives and, and you know, that it's a palm date tree because way up in the sky, you know, way up there, they're dropping these palm dates and, but people are living off of the land. And so Jesus is using this illustration to help people understand. And so don't tell me you're an orange tree and you don't produce oranges. Why you want to be a mango tree when you're called to be an orange tree, that's maybe a whole nother message there, but but Jesus says, tree is known by its fruit. And so I wonder what evidence is it in your life that you belong to Jesus? This is a question just for you to consider. Ask the Lord, God, what evidence is in my life that I belong to you? What is it that the world sees when they look at you? When the, what is it the world sees when they look at the church? What is it that they see in us? What is the evidence that we belong to, to him? There must be change. The Holy Spirit at the point of salvation dwells inside of us, transforming us into his image. And there must be change. And so the simple message for us that will change everything, though, 
is stop faking it and do the will of God. Look to verse 34. Brood of vipers. Brood of vipers. How can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. A good person produces what? Good things from a storehouse of good. An evil person produces what? Evil things from a storeroom of evil. I tell you that on the day, verse 36, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Again, Jesus didn't hold back. Essentially, he calls the religious leaders of the day sons of Satan. You brood viper. You brood of vipers. You, you sons of, of Satan. And, and these people, they were a generation associated with the serpent. They were associated with Satan himself, not with, with God. It was the evil nature that made them speak evil of, of Jesus. We see in verse also in verse 34, that what's on the inside will come out in your life. Do you see that with me in verse 34? For the, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. From the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart, Jesus says. So what is in you is going to come through you. What's in you is going to come through you. What's on the inside will come out in your life. Our words reveal our, our heart. Our words reveal our heart. If you really want to know a person, sit and listen and watch. Sit and listen and watch. Because what's on the inside does and will come out from our lives. If there were good treasure in the heart of these religious leaders, it would show itself in good things. But we know that there was not good in them, evil in them. And so there's this tension between the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, and Jesus. And Jesus is calling, he's calling us even today as the church to stop faking it, to stop just going through the motions, and to do the will of God. That there should be evidence of our lives. I want us to pause and consider what we're taking in. Have you ever... Have you ever paused and considered? Well, why are spiritual disciplines so important for us? It's because what we take in will come out through our actions and through our speech. And so would you pause and just consider? Perhaps this week, this afternoon, take time and, and just consider. Why is it important that we dig into this word uh, every day beyond just Sunday? Why is it important? Because what is inside of us comes out of us. Is the word of God living inside of you? Is it coming forth from your life? That's a good gauge. That's a good gauge. Uh, what does it look like for prayer? Oftentimes our first response is not to go to the Lord. If we are honest, we begin to panic. We start to poll other people, seek to have the counsel of other people. And then once we've heard from everyone else, maybe we will consult God. But why is prayer such an important spiritual discipline? We're going to him, getting along with the Father, spending time with him, listening for his voice. God, would you guide me in this? Would you show me uh, the answer? These spiritual disciplines are so important because they transform us. They transform us. Verse 35, we see that a good person produces good things. An evil person produces evil things. Again, you produce what you are. You produce what you, what you are. Verse 36, we see that there's a call to choose our words wisely. People will have to account for every careless word they speak. Jesus challenges those that are listening that day and even us today, this day, to choose our words wisely. Why is that? Because there's life and death in the tongue. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, would you write that reference down? Proverbs 18, 1 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Those who love it will eat its, its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We should choose our words wisely. We had 
a wonderful marriage event this past Friday night. Matt and Jelaine and the, 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 the Discover group that they're a part of did an awesome job leading this marriage event. One of my friends, Pastor Mike Thedford and his wife Terry came and they spoke, they taught and they did an, an awesome job and, and they shared things that we know, right? But oftentimes we need to be reminded of those things. If you think you got the perfect marriage, well, you can take a step back and just consider there, there's always work to be done, right? There's no such thing as the perfect marriage and there's no such thing as the perfect person. No one just arrives, right? It's a work in progress. Life is a work in progress. One of the things they, they talked about on Friday night was communication. How it's so important in our in communication, particularly in a marriage context, oftentimes we're listening to respond. Now, in this context, you're not necessarily listening to respond, although I think we should listen to respond. <laughs> like we should do something after what we've heard. We, we can't just be hearers of the word, we're doers of the word. But sometimes in this kind of setting, it, it soaks in and there's not an opportunity for response like a, a marriage like this afternoon some of you might have. And, and so, but oftentimes when, when, when that person is speaking, we're not really listening, although we would say we're listening. We're not really listening. We are form, formatting a response. We're formatting a response. And so uh, in communication, in a relationship, it's important that we take a step back and process what's been said. And then we choose our words wisely. There's so many disagreements that uh, could be avoided if we would just take a step back, process, pray, Lord, help me, help me with the proper response. Process and pray, Lord, help me with the proper response. Just take a step back before we, before we uh, have our formatted answer and we respond. Choose words wisely. Look at the verse 37 by you. For by your words, you will be acquitted. You'll be, you'll be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. This is what Jesus says. We, we know that at the point of salvation, those that are in Christ Jesus, there was a moment in your life, if you recall that moment in your life, where you cried out to the living God. Amen. And you acknowledged that you are a sinner. And that Jesus, you're the only Savior. I cannot do for myself what you've already accomplished on the cross of Calvary. And so today I confess you as Lord and Savior. There's a confession. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess that Jesus is Lord, have you made that confession? That Jesus is Lord? Jesus is you are Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. After hearing all of this, look to verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. After hearing all of this, the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day said, we want to see a sign from you. Now, this, this comes after they've already seen sign after sign, miracle after miracle. Jesus has taught with authority time and time again, yet they have the audacity to say, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And so I love what Jesus does next. Look to the word, verse 39. He answered them, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. He said, all right, you want a sign? Well, here it is. <laughs> An evil and adulterous generation demand a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Verse 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Because they repented of Jonah's preaching and look, something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Jonah is here. <clears throat> the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and look, don't miss this, something greater than Solomon is here. They ask for a sign and Jesus says, all right, I'll give you a sign. Jesus Jesus takes them back some 755 years when the prophet Jonah walked this earth. It's something that would have been passed down from generation to generation. 
generation would have told the next generation and the next generation uh, of what was accomplished through the prophet of Jonah. Jonah at, this, at that time in 755 BC was a prophet to the northern kingdom. And God calls him to go to Nineveh and call these people to repentance. And what does Jonah do? Jonah runs. I, I'd encourage you, if it's been a while since you've uh, read the story of Jonah, or maybe you've never heard the story of Jonah, go back to the Old Testament and read this afternoon. It's an incredible story. Many of us have found ourselves as Jonah, running from the will of God, trying to run from the will of God, and it never ends well, right? For Jonah, he's thrown off the, he's thrown off the boat, he's in the sea, uh, uh, this, this fish, this great fish scoops him up, and he lives in there for three days, three nights, and then God's got his attention, he cries out to God, uh, uh, he repents himself, and then he's uh, uh, spit up, thrown up on the sea shore, and then he goes back and uh, preaches the message of repentance. It would have been just much simpler had he just obeyed and done the will of God. But we're, we're much like Jonah in that, that we want to fight, we want to be right, and, and we want to do what we want to do. And God said, nah. And so it's interesting that they asked for a sign. Don't miss this. They asked for a sign. And what does Jesus respond with? He responds with the recollection of Jonah. The recollection of Jonah is what he responds with. And in that, he uh, looks to what is to come. Uh, back in Jonah, this, this is a prophecy of Jesus. That Jesus would be dead for three days. On the third day, he would rise victorious from the grave. And so in this moment, these religious leaders ask for a sign. Jesus, it's a little bit of insight to the evil generation that they uh, were. And, and Jesus says, okay, let's go back to Jonah. And the whole point is that it points to the Messiah. That's the whole point of it all. That it points to the Messiah. That death could not hold him. And after three days and nights, he was alive and free. And some of you might be thinking, though, well, hold on. Jesus here refers to three days and three nights. And, and, uh, but how could it be with a 72-hour period? Have you ever considered this? I've been asked this question many times. Hopefully, maybe some of you are wondering, and we can answer it right here. We don't have to wait till Good Friday rolls around, you know? And so, <clears throat> Rabbi Eliezer writes this, a day and a night make a whole day, and a portion of a whole day is reckoned as a whole day. And so what does that mean? This shows how in Jesus' day, the phrase three days and three nights did not necessarily mean, like we think it should mean, a 72-hour period, but a period including at least the portions of three days and three nights. So, so, so there you go. What's the point of all of this, really? The point of all of this is that in this moment... Jesus points to the cross. That in this moment, Jesus speaking to an evil, wicked generation points to the cross. That Jesus came and that Jesus walked this earth and that Jesus died for a wicked and sinful people. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is no one righteous not even one. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people. Because why? All sinned. All sinned. Romans chapter 7 verse 24 says this, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Do you see Paul's response? Thanks. Be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The religious leaders of the day wanted a sign, and Jesus gives them the sign that He, in fact, is the Messiah who has come to save. That He, in fact, is the Messiah who has come to save. The people of Nineveh and those who would repent, they were saved because they repented. You and I, those that are in Christ Jesus, are in Christ Jesus because there was a moment where you repented of all your sins and you trusted the great forgiveness of Christ Jesus, that his blood was and is sufficient for the salvation of your soul. 
And so this message of repentance, it's the message, it's the message that John the Baptist shared in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. It's the message that Jesus started sharing in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Look back to this section. Again, Jesus makes this point with boldness and clarity. He wants them to know that something, someone greater is here. And church, we should not miss this point either. Again, they're asking for a sign. And there might come a point that you're asking for some kind of a sign too. Can I encourage you to look to Jesus? He is God's sign. Look to verse 43. When an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it roams through waterless places looking for rest, but doesn't find any. Then it says, I'll go back to my house that I came from. Returning, it finds the house vacant, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and settle down there. As a result, that person's last condition is worse than the first. Don't miss this. As a result, the person's last condition is worse than its first. That's how it will also be with this evil generation. He, he says when an unclean spirit comes out of a person. What's Jesus talking about? The, the main point of Jesus was not upon principles of demon possession as we would think. But the seriousness of rejecting him as completely as the religious leaders had. That's Jesus' main point. That these people are rejecting the Messiah. Rejecting Jesus as the Savior of the world. He shares all of this. He shares this illustration. And then in verse 45, as a result, that person's last condition is worse than the first. This rejection of Jesus would leave them much worse off than ever before. They rejected Jesus because he wasn't, uh, 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 because he wasn't messianic enough for them. Like he wasn't religious enough for them. That's, that they rejected him. He wasn't religious. He didn't look the part. They, they also rejected Jesus because they're under oppression, if you recall. They're under uh, Roman oppression. And they're looking for a commander that would rise up and free them. Lift this oppression off. And here's Jesus. I, I, I don't know. When we don't know what he looked like, they, they, they're witnessing Jesus. And it's not what they think he should be. And so they're completely rejecting. And so their desire... For this kind of Messiah would absolutely lead them to ruin in 70 AD. Jesus said, as a result, that person's last condition is worse than the first. Jesus says, stop rejecting me. Jesus says, repent. Look to verse 46. While he was still speaking with the crowds... His mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to the one who was speaking to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and here am I and my brothers. Verse 50, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. After Jesus shares all of this, after Jesus shares the importance of not rejecting, but accepting, out of Jesus shares, use your words wisely and confession, um, there, there comes his, 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 his mom and brothers. Now, scholars, no one knows exactly why his brothers and mothers asked to speak with him, but, but some, would, some would say that it's because it's been a kind of a high tension and Jesus has already called them sons of Satan. And it's not like 
going too, too well here. And so they're coming along, you know, mama's coming along trying to do her mama thing. You know, mama's what I'm talking about, the mama thing. And, and it's like, Hey, maybe we should just soften the message. But Jesus wasn't about to soften anything. Now that's what most scholars believe. And so what is Jesus omniscient, all knowing? What is, what does he say? He says, no, there's no special privileges. There's no special privileges. In fact, those who are really family are those who do the will of my father. Again, Jesus with great boldness. He doesn't sit back. He doesn't soften it. He closes this section for us to see and hear with these bold words. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I, uh, I don't know what it looks like for you. I don't know what your response is to all of this. The simple question would be, are you doing the will of God? Are you living out the calling of God has on your life? And, and only you can answer that for yourself. I can't answer that for you. And the person sitting next to you can't answer that for you. And you can fake it a little bit, but you can't fake it a long time. I can tell you that much. And I have a great growing concern that the church has been kind of just going through the motions for far too long. We've been faking it, if we're honest. And the time for... Continuing to fake it is over. Jesus is coming back one day. And the question is, will you be ready? And what will we have done with the time that the Lord has allowed us to live? What kingdom, again, are we building? Is it his? Whose glory are we living for? I want to challenge you to do the will of God. As we close this teaching series titled Live Missionally, I hope that you have been challenged. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope that you have seen and heard opportunities to step in and live on mission. Pastor Mike came back from sabbatical. I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that after so many numbers of, of years, uh, we could send our family pastor on a sabbatical. 12 years that he has faithfully served with us. And if you knew the toll, if you knew the toll, I'm, I'm here as soon as I'm over, as soon as this is done, I'm going home and I'm going to sleep. Amen. If I'm honest, I don't want to be here right now. I, I, I don't have clarity. I, I'm tired. Something came on me last night, but, I, but I'm here. And uh, And if you just knew the toll of ministry, the church would show a little bit more grace. For those who are doing the will of God, not everyone is doing the will. Of, I can't answer who's doing the will of God, who's not. All I can say is we believe we are within this church. I, I can't answer for every church. He came back and <clears throat> he started handing uh, these little Jesuses out. And at first I thought, man, it's, it's Pastor Mike. He's crazy, right? He does. I mean, one, you never know what he's going to say. And, never, you know, it's, it's, if, you know, if you know him, you love him and. If you don't really know him, sometimes you're wondering, all right? Get, get to know him. That man has a heart for the Lord, for people, for the younger generation. I'm thankful. He's a brother. I'd go into battle with that guy. Well, we do every day. <laughs> uh, he started handing out these old Jesuses. And the first question was, like, Mike, you know, like, where's this money coming from? <laughs> <You know? laughs> We, we, we really do try to practice best stewardship as possible. And I'm like, you know, these things are like 26 cents, man. And uh, <laughs> he said, oh, I do. I have, you know, I'm using some of my family budget money. I said, okay, fair enough. And uh, so anyways, he starts handing these out. He starts handing these out. I'm like, you're crazy. What are you doing? And next thing I know, everybody's talking about these little Jesus things, these little Jesus figures. 
And then we go to this Forest Grove open house, and, and, and we're, we've been praying, church, for years that the Lord would open the door in this middle school down the street, that we would be able to serve them well and make Jesus known, and the Lord has opened the door, and we praise God for that. And so we go to this open house to serve, and, and, and he starts, there's Pastor Mike, he's going off, handing all these things. And it's amazing, the conversations, I'm just standing back watching these conversations and people are opening up, people are laughing, and people are, you know, one lady's crying, and it's like all crazy stuff. I'm like, man, it's just a, like a little Jesus, and we don't even know. Like, he's probably too white on this thing, I can tell you that much. Um, <laughs> haven't been to Israel five times, i uh, tell you that much. But uh, anyways, the point of this is, is uh, he's handing them out, and he's saying, I want you to go give Jesus away. I know it sounds silly, and it's like, well, it's, it's like, is this, is it? But as, but as he is having these conversations and people were engaged in these conversations, some didn't even have Jesus. Some had never even surrendered over to Jesus. And uh, so I've been, witness, I've been witnessing all of this happen, watching all of this happen. And, and, uh, and then I'm watching little kids, my girls, being bold and walking up and handing these little Jesus to people. Amen. And I'm like, so this week I'm praying the close of this series, Live Missionally, and we've got to do something with the call of God on our lives. We better not just come in on a Sunday morning and just warm a seat, and it's all good, and, and I'm trying to live the most comfortable life I can, and to do nothing with the gospel that has saved us. Amen. And so, the Lord said, you know that crazy idea that Pastor Mike, uh, he said, I want you to go buy a few of these, so went and bought 300 of them, and I guess you can do the math on 26 cents, but we, <clears throat> we bought these, and I said, I want to hand them, I want every person that comes this Sunday, as we close this series, to take one of these, but here's what I want to do, something different. They've been all handing them out. I want you to keep this, and I want you to put it somewhere to serve as a reminder. I, I, one of the things I love about gathering on Sundays is we're able to, to, to remember we're able to remember through song and through fellowship and through the word, through the stirring of the spirit of God, we're able to remember that there is a call in our lives, that the church is not 4441 South 25th Street, that you and I are the church and we've been called to be his witness. If you're wondering what the will of God is for your life, can I just answer that clearly for you? I'm convinced on the authority of scripture that the will of God for your life, those who are in Christ Jesus in my life, is to be his witness to the world. Now, I don't know the specifics. I don't know the details. But if you're struggling, like, what is the will of God? And you're, you're witnessing all kinds of life, precious life. Start doing the will of God by being his witness to the world. How will they know? How will they know the gospel if they don't hear it? And what an opportunity for the church to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to go and tell a lost and dying world what our Savior has done for us, that he walked this earth. Not just some myth. It's not just some cute story. He walked this earth, and he died on a Roman cross for the world to see. He was placed in a grave, that borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he rose. And the original eyewitnesses that watched all of this happen, they went and told. And the people that were transformed by the gospel message through the faithfulness of those people, they went and told. And the people that were transformed by the gospel they went and told, and we're here today because a small group of people were faithful to share the gospel of Jesus. And I wonder today, church, will we be faithful? Will we be faithful tomorrow as you go? As you wake up and you go, maybe, maybe it's going to a place you dread. Maybe it's going to a place where there's been persecution already. Maybe it's going to a place where no one even knows your name. Will you lift high the name of Jesus? Will you be a faithful gospel witness through your words and your actions? That's the best description of a witness. 
It's not just someone that has all this information, but it's someone who goes faithfully and who bears the name of Jesus. We have next move following when all of this is said and done. We had a handful after the 9 a.m. And, and I pray that we would have a handful in the back area. Pastor Zach's going to lead that. If you're wondering, what is your next move within this family of faith? What is your next move in serving Jesus and being his witness? I want to encourage you. When all this is said and done, see Pastor Zach in the back for next move. It's a 10-minute conversation and there's cookies. It doesn't get much better than that. And uh, But there are opportunities after opportunities after opportunities for us as the church to go and be his witness to the world, to do the will of God. And the question is, will you, will you do it? Will we commit to being the Christ follower that we've been called to be? I pray that the answer would be yes and amen. We need people in all areas. The Lord's opened up this door at Forest Grove Middle School for three lunches, three lunches that we're able to step onto this campus and preach the word of God to this younger generation. And we need people that will go in with Pastor Mike and Ben to Forest Grove. We have an opportunity at Central High School to lead a Bible club and ICA, Independence Classical Academy, to lead a Bible club. We need, we need people that will say, I will go. I will go. This Wednesday evening, we're feeding college students at IRSC at the, at the dorms. And there's an opportunity show up at 5 30 there's an opportunity for us to go in a what feels like tomorrow but in a couple months we're going to have a one of our biggest events on campus that's a trunk or treat event whether you like trunks or not whether you like the candy or not none of that really matters to me what matters most is that we welcome every person that steps foot on this campus and we look them in the eye and we let them know that there is a God who loves them and that Jesus saves and that there's no other way to salvation, that there's hope in Christ Jesus alone. And so church, the question is, will we, will we be faithful in those opportunities to step in and to be the church? One Tuesday a month. We partner with Graceway Village and we go pump gas and you're saying, what? What good could pumping gas do? Well, it opens a door to again, look someone in the eye, ask, how can I pray for you? It creates an opportunity for a gospel conversation. And, and, and so we need people that will go and pump gas and look people in the eye. You can see that, find out more about that at the next move. Next summer, next summer, there's <clears throat> my voice. We're going to Greece. It's a small group. I mean, I've talked a lot about local stuff, but that's an international destination. If you think you're only going to have fun, you're not going. If you think it's a vacation, don't sign up. We're gonna go hard. We're gonna hit the ground hard, bearing the name of Jesus. Come alongside of some local churches in Thessaloniki and, and then working with a new church plant in Exanthe. We're going to go hard for the gospel. You can find out more about that on September 15th. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I've said a lot. I don't know what your response is today. But um, would you take a moment? Or would you just say, Lord Jesus, help me to do something with what I've heard. God, stir within me. Stir within me. Stir within me. Help me to be your witness, your gospel witness to the world. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're bringing the world to the Treasure Coast, by the way, and, and help me to be found faithful. Help me to serve well. Help me to live this life, to not waste this life, to, to be the church that you called me to be. For your glory. For your glory. 
As people are praying all across this place and people are praying online, I wonder if there might be one here today that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus for salvation. If you were to die right now, you don't know where you would spend eternity. I want you to know on the authority of scripture, you can be 100% certain it has nothing to do with you, it has everything to do with Jesus. And so if you're sitting here today, you're online with us today and you say, I don't know. I don't know if I were to, if I were to die, I don't know where I would spend eternity, but I want to know I want to be sure I want that confidence. Would you call upon the name of the Lord with me? There's people praying all over this place. There's a host online, by the way. If that's your desire to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to repent of your sins, would you call upon the name of the Lord? Would you say something like this? Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And you are the Savior. I can't save myself. And so today, I trust you completely. I put all my faith in you. I believe that you came. That you died on a cross for me, for the world. That you were placed in a grave for me, for the world. And you rose victorious for me, for the world. And so today, I... I surrender it all over to you, Savior. I trust you. Thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer, would you thank him? Would you thank him if that's your prayer? Would you thank him? Lord, we need your help. Some are weak. Some are tired. Some are sick. <laughs> Help us to be faithful, God. Help us to not waste this life. Help us to stop faking it and to do the will of God. Help us, oh God, to be your witness to the world. Thank you for your church. The gift that she is to the world. And so help us to unite together to serve in our giftedness, to be found faithful.